Wheeland Presley Funeral Home and Crematory, a proud supporter of WQPT, has been serving Quad City families since 1889. They now have live stream capabilities for viewing your loved one's funeral or memorial service. At IHM VCU, we've always been here for you. You are and always will be our top priority. We care about your financial and physical health, and we are here. IHM VCU is a proud supporter of WQPT. Making college campuses safer by facing the issue of hazing head on and a statewide campaign to deal with COVID related mental health problems in the cities. Both Iowa and Illinois have tried to deal with COVID-related health issues head on. Masking, social distancing, vaccinations, but there's no simple solution, no magic vaccine for COVID-related mental health issues that we face. More on that in a moment. But first, millions of college students have left their homes and moved to a college campus. Away from home, they're more dependent than ever on peers with college roommates, classmates, fraternity brothers or sorority sisters. For years, Greek life has been the focus of anti-hazing efforts, but it's not the only place where hazing occurs. Hazingprevention.org says 55% of college students in clubs, teams, or other organizations report being hazed. It's an issue being dealt with head on by Western Illinois University's fraternity and sorority life coordinator, Taylor Ziegler, and we talked with her from Macomb. Taylor, you took part in this at Hazing Prevention Institute back in June. Why did you want to do this? I uh, moved here actually from Florida about a year ago. And previous to that, I was very heavy in the work at Florida at my previous institution, University of Central Florida. And I was able to go to an institute in Orlando that I really was impacted by. I think um, we had a panel of family members that were affected by hazing. They had a lot of really great um, professionals in the industry who've done a lot of research on um, reasons, effects, kind of the science behind some of the stuff. and I. I think it's really important for people like me to be educated, to be able to um, not only prevent, but also advocate for these types of things. Well, hazing used to be such an important part of fraternity, particularly fraternity life, you know, decades ago. And, and, and is it still as, I mean, I'm assuming it's not as big a problem, but it's still a very serious hidden problem. Mm -hmm. I would say, it does happen across the nation. I think 2020 was a very lucky time in that there were, that was the first year in over 30 years that there hadn't been a hazing death in the country um, because people were virtual. And now that we're coming back to that in-person activity, I think hired professionals like myself are worried about what might happen as students try to create new quote unquote traditions. Yeah, right. Um, they think they're doing something never done before, very unique, very exciting. Um, and it's up to us to be able to educate them and help them provide activities that are positive for team building and learning about each other. Well, I was surprised by a statistic that I read that 55% of college students in clubs and teams report being hazed. That's more than half. 55% of people are reporting that. It makes me wonder, there's, there must be a huge spectrum of what hazing is. Yes, um, I would say we call it kind of a little H to a big H, but it's all illegal, not okay. Um, but it could be stemming from mental and emotional abuse down to the physical and alcohol abuse. So things that people um, maybe not see the signs of, but also until something is so big and so bad that it stems to um, people getting injured, people getting hurt, people dying. And it's not just a problem with, with Greek life. It's not just fraternities and sororities. I mean, you, you see it in athletic groups and other clubs as well. Yeah, definitely. I would say that is something that people don't always realize, but there are many, many news um, articles and things where you can find where it's been apparent in other articles, thinking of like the band incident that happened at um, Florida A&M many years ago. Right. Um, it happens in student government, athletics, the military all over. And I think people just aren't talking about it enough and which is why it kind of goes under the radar. It also seems to always be a male thing that you're seeing it more in fraternities, but that's not necessarily true? I would say I think the bigger cases that get reported because of the injuries that occur or the alcohol abuse or um, drinking in excess, things like that, that's what gets more reported because that's what people 
kind of understand as hazing. They don't really recognize the emotional things that go along with it as well. And I think um, it does happen amongst all groups, men and women. Now you're also what, you're active with Sigma Delta Tau, right? Yes, so I am a national volunteer for the sorority that I was a part of as a um, undergraduate member. I'm very active in our national volunteer. I'm an advisor, a regional director um, for our chapters back in Florida. And how do you do prevention in a sorority that would be different than how you would do it in a fraternity? Or is there no difference? Yeah, I would say it's very similar in that we just try to do a lot of education, but also bring um, ideas for positive team building and activities, things that can still be really great traditions and organizations that don't have to involve drinking. Is it a bit of also, um, I don't know, casting people as being part of the in crowd and the out crowd and thereby it may not be um, a hazing initiation that involves drinking, but, but maybe something more you know, mentally uh, uh, debilitating for somebody? Yeah, I say it all comes down to um, a place of power and privilege. And when you have a group that is looking to a group to, they want that group to join them, but they're saying, you have to do these things to join. That's where that power and privilege comes into play. Yeah, you, you, you remember that movie back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, Animal House, all about the, uh, the Delta fraternity. And everyone would laugh about that. It's one of the, one of the, uh, the, the movies that are considered a, a, a comedic masterpiece. Mm-hmm. But it really gives fraternities and sororities a black mark. Yeah, it's, it's disappointing because we try to really break that stigma and grow our community because our fraternities and sororities do really amazing things nationwide. They are, I mean, statistically, people that are joined fraternities and sororities are more likely to graduate on time. They're more likely to have a higher GPA than the average student body. Um, They're more likely to um, get a job after college. They raise thousands upon hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars for really great organizations, but those things are often overlooked by that negative stigma. Well, and let's be honest, I mean, Western has 11 fraternities, five sororities, 12 uh, Greek councils. It's really an important part of uh, Western's social life for students, academic, and as you said, professional and outreach is so important as well. Yeah, I really love to advocate for this community because I think they do such amazing things for the student body. Um, They make up about 11% here currently at Western and I would love to bring more students into that community because of those reasons. So after being a part of this, uh, this hazing seminar at, at the Institute, what are you bringing to Western this year? What, what is the biggest thing that you learned that you want to uh, spread and to share with uh, uh, fraternities and sororities at Western? Yeah, the biggest piece is just buy-in from the entire student body and also faculty and administrators at Western. So I've got a lot of really great key players Um, that are kind of above me in the university administrative place. So they are doing a great job of helping me implement some policies, some education, and we're doing um, National Hazing Prevention Week on a really big scale this year. So I'm really excited for that as well. And it's on our Fraternity and Sorority Life website, the schedule of events. Well, and let's be really honest. I mean, there is zero tolerance, not only at Western, but at so many different colleges and universities across America. What does that mean? I mean, do you think that every fraternity and sorority, I don't want to say is already on notice, but they certainly know the seriousness of what can happen? Yeah, I would agree. I think there are many states, I would say majority of the states in the United States have a um, law against hazing and it stems um, from the big cases where students are dying and it's really unfortunate. And But um, more and more um, laws are coming into play. There's a big one that's up in the house right now for the state of Ohio. Um, there's been some passed in Florida more recently and I'm hoping Illinois joins the trend too and kind of um, increases the stakes there. But as you said, I mean, when it comes to hazing and so many times it's, it's an issue of power. Mm-hmm. Um, so tell me about that. I mean, how do you break that down? Um, I would say the biggest piece is reminding our students that we all are one, we're one. We're here for the same reason. Like these student groups, they are here to get an education and to have the tools to be able to be successful post-graduation. And so reminding them that you were once in their shoes just because you're a senior does not mean that you are in this place of power. You must take the time to really get to know these new members and become friends with them. And you are all equal. Nobody is above anybody else in this situation. And so we do a lot of activities where our older students, our seniors and juniors participate in 
really getting to know and develop those sisterhood and brotherhoods on a deeper level. Well, in so many different ways, the key was to break the culture. Because let's be mm -hmm. honest, a lot of the uh, people who are involved in fraternities, their brothers were in fraternities, their fathers, their uncles, their grandfathers. This is the way it always was done. Initiation, hazing, it's part of the culture. This is the way it's done. Has that, for the most part, gone away? I would say so. For the most part, I think a while some alumni members come back and say, well, we've done it this way before, or that's not how we used to do it when my day. Um, our members, I would say this younger generation is really great for standing up for themselves and saying, well, this is how we're going to do things. And I'm, I'm really proud of them for the way that they go about making their voices heard. And it's going to be an important year. Just to talk as a, as a, uh, as a person who's on campus right now, how important is 2021, 2022 as far as getting back to normal, not only on campus, but of course in Greek life as well? Yeah, I think we are in a year of kind of that redevelopment where our students are coming off of a virtual period where they we're not able to socialize in the same methods that they've been able to before. And so it's just kind of navigating that and how they operate and getting back to kind of where they were before. But many of them are having to um, re-educate some of the things that they've done previous to COVID, how they would plan events in person and things like that. They're big philanthropy events because they had to pivot to a virtual kind of fundraiser um, and getting back to that stuff. And what do you say to the parents whose kids are going off to college perhaps for the first time? This is, uh, uh, they're away from home and, and the kids are looking at a, a fraternity or a sorority and a parent might be going, thinking back, you know, to Animal House and, 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 yeah. and the past. What do you say to parents these days that may have some concerns? I would say reach out to whoever oversees fraternity and sorority life um, on that campus if you have um, some nerves about your student joining or you're apprehensive do your research about what is happening on that campus today what are some of the good that they're doing um, talk to current students about their opinions and ideas opposed to just telling your student no you can't do that because the more and more we push students away from these opportunities we're hindering them in the experience and the growth that they can have in college i mean thinking of the great things that fraternities and sororities do on it for an individual student they can really go far in life and parents should not hinder that. Western Illinois University Fraternity and Sorority Life Coordinator, Taylor Ziegler. Ready or not, autumn is here, but it doesn't mean you have to be holed up inside your house all day. Laura Adams has some great ideas for you if you head out and about. This is Out and About for September 17th through 23rd. The Mississippi Valley Blues Festival in LeClaire Park is coming the 17th and 18th, while NAMI Walks, a fun, family-friendly event supporting those living with a mental health issue, is held at Veterans Memorial Park the 18th from 8 to 11 a.m. The 11th annual Fall Frolic Gala at the Outing Club for the German American Heritage Center takes place the 17th, and it's time for the Riversance Festival of Fine Art in the Village of East Davenport the 18th and 19th. Or join the annual Fall Flea Market Antique and Collectible Show in Makokoda on the 19th. Plus, there's music, music, music with the A.V. Grouse Band perform at the Dear Wyman House the 19th at 4. Live at 5 features Far Out 283 and QC Vinyl the 17th starting at 5 at River Music Experience. Mercado on 5th presents Lulac Night in downtown Moline on the 17th, while Joan Jett and the Black Hearts play at the Adler Theater the 19th. At the Spotlight Event Center, enjoy Tubbs and Moss, a vintage jazz experience on the 17th. On stage, Circa 21 opens Disenchanted, a hilarious, naughty musical about growing older as a princess. Next door, it's week two of Speakeasy's Laugh Hard stand-up comedy competition on Saturday. Plus, Carmen Morales performs at Tom Foolery on Tremont at the Renwick Mansion on the 19th starting at 7. For more information, visit WQPT.org. Thank you, Laura. Musician Jenny Lynn Stacy says she provides an eclectic and comforting array of melodies strung together with love. Before the pandemic, she joined us at Downtown Moline's Black Box Theater to perform one of her originals. So here's Jenny Lynn Stacy with Nothing to Lose.
Jenny Lynn Stacy and nothing to lose. You can check out some of her new performances anytime on Facebook. It's Jenny Lynn Stacy and the Dirty Roosters. COVID-19 is proving to be a mental issue as well as a physical one. A Kaiser Family Institute study found that two in five adults have felt symptoms of anxiety and depression due to the pandemic. There's worsening sleeping and eating disorders. There is growing substance abuse issues as well. There's also more help available if you need it. FEMA is helping fund continued mental health resources under an umbrella called COVID Recovery Iowa. And we talked with Mike Lightbody about what's available. Mike, COVID Recovery Iowa has been in operation for a while. What's been the response so far? It varies. It varies on who you talk to. Um, my focus has been on supporting Iowans with disabilities, and the response so far has been a lot of there's fear, anxiety, depression, this kind of social isolation comes about. Um, and, and, and so what we hear is um, those sentiments and my counselors help kind of work through that stuff. Well, especially uh, I would think the anxiety, because let's be honest, every week it's a different headline and oh my gosh, things are getting better. The pandemic might be over then. Oh, here comes this variant that, that is really getting kids sick and, and other people. It's like the anxiety level isn't changing. And let's be honest, our nerves have been at wit's end since last March. Yeah, really working on those coping skills, like take a deep breath, doing all those kind of meditative processes. We do that on the phones and we also do that for a lot of virtual activities that work through those processes. So explain to me COVID Recovery Iowa. It, it's, it's thanks to a federal grant, is it not? That's correct. Yeah, so there is a FEMA grant, it's a FEMA funded program um, and there's several uh, organizations throughout the state that use this funding to support Iowans uh, all Iowans. Uh, my particular focus is supporting Iowans with disabilities, um, specifically developmental disabilities, um, but we also support older Iowans, folks with brain injuries, uh, a wide variety of disabilities out there. And we're at the Center for Disabilities and Development at the University of Iowa, um, University of Iowa Healthcare. Well, and as you know, throughout Iowa, rural areas really seem to be very underserved when it comes to uh, mental health treatment. Is this where you come in more handy because of the way you operate? Well, that was the concept behind um, Karen Hyatt at the Department of Human Service uh, of this program was to help supplement because we knew that there was going to be a lot of mental health related needs throughout the state that were going to be exacerbated because of the pandemic. So we definitely see, you know, that as a um, we're not looking for to replace those, you know, establishing services, but maybe draw some connections, help out folks a little bit that uh, need that kind of coping skills and ongoing support. How does COVID recovery actually reach out to people? So there's a couple toll free lines for people to connect with us at, at it's 844-775-9276. That's the Iowa warm line. Um, there's also the Iowa concern line at 800-447-9276. 1985. Uh, but you can all get that information at covidrecovery.org um, where there's an intake process to just uh, to get involved in the program and uh, get access to those uh, services. The key though is for people to reach out as you know and, and that sometimes is the most difficult thing because people just want to handle it on their own. I mean that seems to be the insurmountable thing that you have to face is that the people who may need the help just aren't willing to get it. Yeah, uh, so uh, we've done a little something unique here at the Center for Disabilities and Debe Development with a little bit of a different branding uh, because traditionally this is known as a crisis system, a counseling system. So we've done that rebranding we've gotten into is the idea of a social check-in or a friendly visiting service. Like, hey, can I just check in with you? See how you're doing, there's no um, we're not going to turn this into a formal professional counseling session. Just see how things are going. Uh, we've got a special uh, uh, text platform that we use that we um, call Chat Buddy. People can text the word Chat Buddy to 85511 and just do a really non committal um, connection with our team to, to just see how things are going. We do that also with a lot of connecting with local disability service providers throughout the state, a lot of care coordinators, case managers. So it's kind of that lifeline out 
um, to a lot of folks that might not have that service, might not have that ongoing support. Um, and it's all through those partnerships that we've developed to, to make it, to make the, that chasm, that jump over the chasm into getting, you know, just talking to someone. It's really important to have that safety net and to have that support when it comes to mental health, uh, to lessen the anxiety. And so often that's friends and families. But this pandemic has split people. It has split families that have split friends apart. Doesn't that make it even tougher for some people that, that the people that they used to depend on during any other crisis or during any other situation, they can't depend on now because of the, politis, you know, the, the politicizing of uh, COVID-19? Yeah, I just, uh, I guess I would riff a little bit on the whole idea of the, you can't physically go do a lot of this stuff anymore. There's, there's regulations, there's rules that we've had to deal with over the last year and a half. And so what might, and that's even more exacerbated for folks with uh, develop, or d disabilities, um, where they're already kind of feeling these isolations uh, from society. So what we do is we help people work through rebuilding those skills, rebuilding those networks that might might have been damaged over the past year and a half of isolation. You know, it, it could be digital, um, you know, d you know, getting folks on FaceTime or Zoom or just talking over uh, Facebook, even social media channels, um, or, you know, it could be just, you know, when's the last time you talked to, you know, a family member and redeveloping those connections and meeting new friends too. We offer a lot of virtual activities during the week that, um, lots of folks are able to connect with across the state and they hop onto zoom and they're able to meet new friends that they wouldn't have met before, uh, without the service. At the very beginning of this pandemic, so many people were thrown out of their jobs. Um, and, and money became a huge issue. And let's be honest, when it comes to mental health and anxiety, the, you know, money is often the root of the problem. That's right, and we get a lot of those calls um, and, and questions about money-related issues, whether it be employment, rent, housing. You know, uh, we work a lot with the 211 systems and the Iowa Compass uh, and the area agencies on aging to help figure out what are those financial resources that we can connect people with and this COVID Recovery Iowa program is a great you know way to get people connected to those programs. You're planning on announcing some uh, new additions to the program in the coming week? Yeah uh, so what we're looking at is we're in the summertime right now people are getting out they're getting outside but as fall and winter approaches we need to be prepared to you know Getting back inside the house, you know, who knows what the pandemic will bring, uh, but uh, those are the types of services that we're wanting to kick back up. Again, we've got a lot of great um, programs going here in connection with the University of Iowa and the Therapeutic Recreation Department um, to bring that into, into light in the, uh, in the fall uh, semester. How important is it that kids are physically in school right now? I mean, the, the, I think we for, had forgotten how important schools are to the social fabric of all of our communities. Yeah, Jim, I, I don't have a lot of the focus with the kids. I will say that um, for kids with special education needs, that in-person stuff is vitally important because uh, you can't do a lot of the virtual activities. And we've learned that even supporting adults with uh, disabilities, there's certain things that you just cannot do virt in a virtual environment. So we, we try to find those pieces to, to that do work, you know, whether it be uh, you know, you know, a pen pal program or other kinds of uh, programs like that. Mike Lightbody, Program Director for Iowa Compass, one of the programs benefiting from COVID Recovery Iowa. On the air, on the radio, on the web, on your mobile device, and streaming on your computer, thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. Presley Funeral Home and Crematory, a proud supporter of WQPT, has been serving Quad City families since 1889. They now have live stream capabilities for viewing your loved one's funeral or memorial service. At IHM VCU, we've always been here for you. You are and always will be our top priority. We care about your financial and physical health, and we are here. IHM VCU is a proud supporter of WQPT.